Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our Friday talk. Um, it's a real honor, it's a privilege um, to be able to talk to you today. And a, a, a real thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me. What I thought I'd do in today's Friday talk is I would share some thoughts and, and observations um, and enter afterwards into a discussion with yourselves around the developments and the demands of the German healthcare system um, under the circumstances of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And as with a lot of things, um, you know, um, it's also with this particular talk, um, some of the observations are my very personal observations and views, um, and some are really facts-based, and I will indicate where the facts um, um, are. So I have structured um, the agenda um, in a sense to briefly touch upon the importance of our health industry in the context of societal stability um, and also the impact our industry has on our economy. Um, and I will include at the end also some recommendations um, what kind of environment, what kind of framework conditions we need um, to really be able to deliver on those dimensions. Um, and I deliberately decided to keep the presentation and this talk uh, rather high level, go relatively fast um, so that we have enough time for our discussion. Because this is what I understand from the organizers um, is, is what you're most interested in. So um, over the past decade or so, um, we observed some general trends in society. And one trend is um, an increasing expectation um, on health and well-being. Um, it's what our society is really longing for, especially also in developed nations. Um, we also, and I had the pleasure and privilege to visit China um, in the last few years, a couple of times, um, and we observe a similar trend in China. Um, and and it's, it's one of the key reasons that the Chinese government has made um, health coverage and health uh, performance a major priority is all about maintaining societal stability. One message um, that I would love to leave you with is that the healthcare industry is delivering. And this is what you see on this particular chart, um, which shows a significant decline in mortality of heart diseases since the 70s. Now, when you look overall at life expectancy, life expectancy has increased over the past decades quite substantially. Today, we have an average life expectancy in excess of 80 years, up from 60 years in average in the early 1950s. Um, that's over three months every year that we add life expectancy. Um, I referred to China um, a minute ago, and when we look at Shanghai, for example, the city of Shanghai, the average life expectancy has reached already Western standards within just 20 years. Um, and what's even more important there were two theories um, in, in, in the scientific community discussed, the medicalization theory and the compression theory. Medicalization theory means we live longer, but we are longer sick. So the, 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 the unhealthy period um, extends. The compression theory, in simple terms, said we live longer, productive, healthy years, and the amount of sick years stays the same and is usually at the end of the life expectancy. And what we've seen in the developed nations is that these life years are productive years and it confirms the compression theory. We're living longer and we're living healthier and we're having more productive life years. Um, and that effect is significantly also driven by advancements in medicine Medi uh, medical devices, innovative technologies, and uh, innovation um, of procedures like, you know, heart surgery, 
uh, or intelligent, intelligent surgeries. So, and on top of it, um, it's also about the focus in the developing countries living healthier. So anything to do with diet, uh, diet and, and, and healthy living, more sport, being more active, is these are the three elements, medicines, med tech, and healthier living that contribute to the increasing life expectancy. So what the current pandemic also shows us is that we compare as a nation relatively well uh, to other countries um, in the pandemic. We came into the pandemic a little bit later than other countries, but we seem to be less hurt than other countries and we seem to be moving faster out of the pandemic. One key reason, for example, is that we in Germany have a dual healthcare system with office-based practicing physicians and with hospital-based practicing physicians. And that makes it um, easier when you triage patients. So regular care can still take place, like if you suffer from multiple sclerosis or uh, any other neuro neurological disease, you go to a specialist and you don't necessarily need to enter a hospital. That's very different from a number of other countries where every patient, whether it's a COVID-19 patient or whether it's a, um, an unhealthy patient with another condition, they all need to be triaged through one hospital. Another reason is the number of our ICU beds, which in relative terms is amongst the highest in the world. And also, of course, access to innovative medicines and medical devices which really differs uh, from country to country in Germany is here leading the way, especially also access to testing technology and testing platforms. But even our highly developed system needs improve, improvement. And that's also shown through the pandemic, mostly in the digital space, um, i.e. telemedicine, um, data usage to control the pandemic, i.e. the warning app. Um, transparency about ICU capacity, where are the beds and are they occupied or not. So a number of areas mainly linked to digitalization is where we need improvements. Another important learning um, is, and that's especially out of uh, the crisis in 2008, nine, the financial and economic crisis, where the health industry has proven to be a very stable anchor um, and significantly contributing um, to the GDP um, also here in Germany. And that's also true for the current crisis. When you look at it, um, the health industry is a core driver of our value creation, not just through innovation, but innovation that can be exported. Um, our export activity significantly exceeds the um, in-market uh, demand. Um, we are a key driver in terms of R&D investment, the highest ratios um, in the industry, but also uh, in, in, in all industries, uh, but also um, the absolute um, investment, uh, financial investment, and the absolute amounts invested in research and development are just close to the aerospace industry and the highest um, amongst all industries in the world. And of course, we are significant employment factor, a direct one, because we are significant industry also here in Germany with over 140,000 uh, employees in the research based industry. But there's also a number of um, indirect employment effects, people de depending on our industry and providing services um, with our products, the entire healthcare sector, which is a significant, significant contributor uh, to employment and of course to our social stability. So the economic um, power of our industry is significant and it does when you compare it to a number of areas and I don't want to trigger a huge debate here, but it's significantly larger than the automotive industry, for example, where we talk a lot about um, how do we support this sector as a key sector in Germany. But this leads me to some uh, general remarks that I quickly want to go through um, around our business model 
especially in the research-based pharmaceutical sector. And perhaps one can describe it with just uh, two, two, three, four words, and it's a high-risk, high-reward business. So what you see here is um, on, the, on the graph is um, the time it takes to develop a new molecule, a new pharmaceutical. Um, and what you see, it's, it's structured in three um, stages. The investment stage, the stage of uh, making a profit, returning a profit, and the stage that I will touch base upon in a, in a minute. Now, um, when we look at the investment phase, um, what you see on the right hand side is, um, you know, it's probably in excess of a billion Swiss francs that needs that, that investment is required to research, develop and manufacture and provide a new pharmaceutical um, in today's world. Um, what a lot of people don't know throughout this investment phase, um, it's probably not just um, you know the number of companies involved, but it's the number of companies that won't that won't ever make it. Um, and usually um, there is no firm number, but um, I think there's a few indicators um, showing that it's probably one out of um, hundred companies starting an endeavor, developing a new product, will ever make it to the market and therefore be able to return a profit. And those who will make it to the market. Um, which is at the end, they probably will have researched over a thousand candidates and molecules to finally bring one to the market. They have a relatively short period of time to return a profit, which is the exclusivity period, which is covered by patents um, before generic drugs access the market. Um, but what also happens um, with the transparency um, in our society and sharing of knowledge in the public domain is that period of generating a profit shortens over time. In the late 90s, we had usually an exclusivity period of over 10 years. Um, in today's world, that exclusivity period has shortened to three to five years, simply because the competition overtakes you. They have access to the knowledge, they have access to advancing that knowledge even further, and that exclusivity peri period shorten significantly, which in other terms means the innovation cycle and the speed of innovation accelerates substantially, um, which is actually good for patients because there's more innovation um, available to treat patients. But the risky nature of our business is increasing. Now, what most people forget to look at is what happens after the patent expires um, and the innovation is there forever until um, a better product takes over. Um, and we see this today in the cardiovascular area or with antibiotics. Most of the drugs, and you see this in dark blue, this is when the product has, ex uh, the patent have ex has expired. Everyone can access that technology without any investment into research and development and manufacture the product. And of course, provide it to a fraction of the original price because you never take a risk you just reproduce what's available. And um, that is also what we see on the right hand side. It's covered by um, the WHO list of essential medicines. There's over 200 um, essential medicines listed and uh, almost none is still covered or protected by a patent. And that's where the benefit to society really sits. It's not in the short investment period. It's not in the short period of making a profit. It's when the innovation is there forever to society and everyone has access to it. So just illustrating the risky nature of our business and going back to the current pandemic, um, and it's, it's, it's almost illustrative what I show here on this slide. And a lot of people asking me, is this correct? And is this right that the public sector is making so much investments in fighting COVID-19? Um, it's billions, it's billions of dollars and, and euros and Swiss francs that are going into um, mainly manufacturing capacity. And this is... Um, I think now that we understand the risky nature of our business model, um, it's almost obvious 
that if you want to tackle um, a disease where there is no effective mechanism to tackle the disease, usually it takes years, millions of investments um, and billions of investment that if you want to accelerate that, that you need to do something very differently. But this is not really where the investment goes. There is currently over um, 140 companies, for example, um, developing and, and researching vaccines. Now, these companies, they are already there. Um, th th there was no money needed from the government uh, to you know, ignite these companies or uh, come up with inventions um, or innovations. But what the most uh, of uh, the public funding is going into is to secure supply. So it's clearly, um, it shows the level of public investment going into research and development of these technologies to fight COVID-19 is due to the risky nature of our business. You must significantly overinvest in order um, to um, be successful with finally a product and hopefully with a product. Now, another observation and, and where we clearly lag behind, but we knew this before uh, the pandemic, is um, the degree of digitalization, um, whether it's in the public sector, um, whether it is in the healthcare sector, whether it is um, in the industry overall, how we are connected and how we can use and utilize data. Um, we do lag behind. We also lag behind in the healthcare um, sector, but that is where we are not alone. Um, no other country has really found the clue um, to improve um, their um, healthcare system through digital tools. Um, there are some aspects where others are better. We're certainly lagging behind. Um, we're not a front runner, uh, but this is where we really have chances and, and really see opportunities. It's for, uh, you know, foremost in the areas of generating insights, um, better knowledge, and of course, how do we create system efficiencies? And that's what I want to talk about next. So what we need in principle is we need to have a clear look on a patient, a clear look on diseases. And that's why I call, uh, what, what I call uh, an unpixeled view um, on a patient profile. Um, and what we also need is we need um, a look through one lens um, for all stakeholders. Currently, it's the radiologist that looks at the radiograph. It's the surger, surgeon who looks at his surgical procedure. It's inter internal medicine uh, uh, doctor who looks at the data about the cardiovascular uh, condition, but they are never connected and that's the issue. Um, how do we create a lens where everyone who looks at a patient and his or her disease sees the same and then can make a decision how they can contribute? Um, and one of the core benefits if we did this and if we did this well is we would take the chance out of the system. It doesn't matter whether you're close to a university hospital, whether you're close to a specialist, if we use the digital tools to advance knowledge and share knowledge, it would take chances out of the system and everyone would have equal access to innovation. That's the true benefit. And we are already in a very good position. Um, we have the technologies, um, we have the data, we just need them need to use them together um, and we need to connect the technologies with information and we need to share that information widely especially with all stakeholders as i described before to have a clear view on the patient whoever looks at the patient is involved with the medical condition of that patient has the same view sees the same information and then can make the most appropriate decision. It is so obvious, um, but to turn it into reality is where the challenge lies. What I would like to talk now about is why is access to health data so important for us as an industry? Um, and in fact, it's, it's, it's obvious because it's the essence of which our products are made of. Um, it's, it's not the technology that people buy or that people use. It's not the pill or the capsule. It's the knowledge that's within the capsule, that's within the pill, or that's within the ampule. 
Um, on top, it's about 85% um, of all clinical studies are currently being conducted via the health industry. 95% um, of all medical advancements are generated by the health industry, and it's about 100% of uh, the medical devices that are being produced, researched, and developed by uh, the health industry, usually in collaboration and cooperation with healthcare professionals and with um, academic institutions, but it's driven by the industry. And this is, this is why we need data, because it was always data that were the essence of, of our products. And we use data today, of course, uh, to improve um, decision-making, um, which diagnosis, um, which therapy should follow, um, how do we assess uh, side effects, um, how do we address th side effects. Um, for all of that, health data is so critical. Um, and for us, you know, the, the opportunity having direct and better access to publicly available health data is also that we could accelerate clinical research because we could have data-based um, research in routine clinical practice. So instead of running artificial clinical trials, we could look into regular care, look at the data, see what happens with the patient, um, how does the patient respond, what other conditions and circumstances are around that patient, and then draw conclusions, not for that individual patient, but if we see patterns um, with a number of similar patients and how they respond. And that type of research which is routine-based clinical practice um, can be accessed through digital technology. But therefore, we need to have a, a different um, kind of framework that I will talk about in a minute. So what else is, is it's not just um, advancing medicines or medtech um, products um, through access of data. We also could protect, protect the system from excess, excessive demand, uh, for example, during and after the pandemic. Um, for example, um, creating transparency, triaging patients according to their risk profile, stratifying patients according to their risk, which we do today with age, but also patients with heart diseases, other conditions. Should they have faster access, for example, or should they be prioritized over other patients with lower risk factors? But in order to have that information available, we need to have that data. Um, and of course, what we've all seen through uh, the pandemic is the benefits that we have by using telemedicine, not going into an environment that's eventually unhealthy for us, but accessing it from at home and having an informed discussion with a healthcare provider about our condition. So telemedicine is available today, but it's not being used because there's a number of restrictions. Um, and in order to um, accelerate um, usage of these digital tools and technologies available to us, we first and foremost need a pragmatic approach to data protection and also um, a transnational alignment across the Bundesländer um, of the um, data protection legislation. We also need you know, working interfaces uh, for structured and high quality data exchanges between healthcare professionals, large institutions, um, industry, Kanken, Kassen, we need these interfaces. And of course, we need as a society realize and have an increased focus on the economic value that can be created through digital products. So also protecting the value chain that currently in the B2B business or in the B2C business mostly resides in California, that we um, also acknowledge that there is significant value creation opportunities for us here in Germany. So as hard and as, as painful uh, the pandemic is to all of us, um, the pandemic is teaching us a few lessons and, and I suggest we listen to these lessons. Um, First lesson is the fast respond. 
response. It's incredible. It's incredible how many clinical studies are currently ongoing. It's over 900 clinical studies worldwide in the fight of COVID-19. Um, we have um, just over 250 clinical studies currently being registered and run um, to develop new medicines or repurpose existing medicines in clinical studies. So the, the, the level of response time, the speed of which, which was needed or required to set up these clinical studies is, is just, we haven't seen that before. Usually it takes months to initiate a clinical study. Um, this time, um, specifically with the focus on COVID-19, we manage sometimes to do it within days or a week. Um, knowledge sharing. Uh, we experience um, a level of collaboration and cooperation, especially with the public authorities that we haven't seen before. Um, and this is specifically to accelerate that um, process of advancing um, innovation through clinical trials or getting them registered. Um, so here the knowledge sharing between science, industry, um, other key stakeholders and health authorities um, is unseen and unheard of. Um, at the end, what we need is, um, and what we've recognized probably also as a society, but also as critical stakeholders, is the import, importance of cohesive solutions. Um, how diagnosis, how risk profiling, how triaging, how providing for capacity, um, providing the right treatments at the right time, um, having vaccines available to us, um, how they all need to be tackled at once. We cannot wait um, and do it sequentially. We have to do it together. On top, of course, all the measures that the government had to take in terms of whether it's social distancing, recommending wearing face masks, and all um, the other measures like closing down restaurants, um, which all have a dreadful um, impact on our econo uh, economy. Um, but all these measures, um, and, and at the same time, the search for innovation had to be focused and had to be done at once. And that is really a lesson um, that it can be done that the current pandemic has taught us. Uh, some of you might have seen um, some images in the media or on television, uh, but the reason why, we, why it's so important that health um, officials like the health minister um, that ministers like the Prime Minister of Bavaria, um, that, that we receive their support, also their public support and their public commitment um, is so important. And some criticize it and say, you know, this is too much of politics coming together with the industry. Um, and is this, really, is this really justified? I feel personally it is. Um, when you develop tests within weeks, days and weeks, instead of years, if you are able to develop drugs within months instead of years, if the collaborative and joint effort to develop hopefully an effective vaccine within one to two years instead of three to five years, then it's justified that we show uh, our support of each other together. And one element that is not shown here, but is really crucial is when you remember back uh, um, and, and you think about it, that a lot of governments have tried to focus on how do we close down borders? How do we protect our own industry? How do we protect uh, ourselves from not having access to medtech devices, face masks, breathing machines or drugs? Um, so the, the, the temptation of government officials uh, to, to come down on the industry, use military hospitals to distribute tests or whatever is available, um, that is something, it, it's usually a reflex in a crisis. And I'm so, I have to say, pleased, and I'm, I'm really thankful to our government officials that they did not um, change things upside down, although they came up with certain legislations that we sometimes like, sometimes we don't like. But fact is, they didn't use the public sector power um, to take, you know, I would say, um, the, I would say, the, the functioning um, of the private sector away. 
Um, what they did is they relied upon the private sector, for example, the installed base of labs and, and lab machines, uh, the way uh, our um, hospital system is functioning, um, how medicines are coming and reaching the patient. They didn't start interfering with everything um, we did in normal situations. They leveraged the existing system, which is a collaborative system um, consisting of a private and a public element. And by not destroying that, um, I would say that balance, I think that was one of the core factors why we came out so fast um, of that crisis or are still managing the crisis much better than others do. Um, and as we talk about, and since we're talking about politicians, um, it shows also a level of flexibility how fast um, politicians um, react um, and can react if there is a need. And I just know that we've um, th that this government has prepared for more than a year for the Euro European Council presidency. Um, it took them about two months to completely change and rearrange the agenda and the focus um, so that, uh, especially in the healthcare sector, um, we look at lessons learned for COVID-19. We look how we're strengthening uh, the resilience of our um, manufacturing and supply capacity in Europe. Um, and of course, how do we advance the health data space in Europe? These are um, top priority agenda items now for the EU presidency. Um, and it's just testimony to the fact that also um, our uh, politicians and their political agenda um, can change fast, which I think in this particular case is a good thing. So um, these were my, my fast runs and sharing my thoughts with you. Now I'm really looking forward to our discussion.